Welcome back to the Channel Family and another broadcast. My name is Paul. I'm in Peterhead in Scotland. Really pleased to be sharing concerning the book of Yona today. Um, it's quite interesting uh, looking at the prophets. Of course, there's been lots and lots of prophets throughout the history of the world. Um, and Elohim Yahweh has chosen um, over a dozen of them to be in the scriptures. What is a prophet? Well, a prophet is someone who declares clearly the voice, the word, and the counsel of Elohim Yahovah. That is what a prophet is. Uh, principally proclaiming the voice, word, and counsels of God. We generally think of a prophet as telling the future. That is one of the roles of a prophet, uh, but it's neither unique nor essential to do that in order to be a prophet. It's principally about being the voice of God. Now, it's quite interesting, friends, to look at the chronology um of these persons um and when they appeared vis-a-vis -vis the history of israel you know the history of the planet um at what point to the best of our knowledge in what year uh who was reigning as king over israel and king over judah at that time and it's also quite interesting to look at the events um that happened during the time of of, of their um, declaration of the word and councils and purposes of Elohim, Yahovah. Now, um, there are several prophets mentioned in scripture who do not have books of scripture, as in the collection of books we know as the Bible, the Biblios, the book of books. As I've said before, the Bible is not a book. It is a book of books. It is a book containing, con containing 66 books. Uh, Revelation actually has uh, seven letters in it. So it's at least eight books. It's the book of Revelation, for example. Uh, the book of Psalms is itself a book of five books. So there's another five. But, but for the purpose of brevity uh, and modernity and, and uh, moving forward with the discourse today, uh, the Bible is a collection of 66 books. Um, there are over a dozen prophets have books by their own name, but there are also various other prophets mentioned in scripture who are not given books of the Bible. Principally, Elijah and Elisha. And then, of course, you have Nathan the prophet in the time of King David. Um, and then you, you have... Other times, you have King David, who was something of a prophet. He was certainly the king, uh, and he even interceded in a priestly fashion as well. A priest, prophet, and king, you see. But all these persons, they point to one person, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God and the King of Israel. Now, in terms of the chronology of the prophets, as we know, um, the first one, the one that we're going to be looking at today is the book of Yonah, which means a dove, a dove, Yonah, uh, Jonah in the modern English. Now, on the screen there, I've got a chronology of the prophets, and it, it does look a little bit complex on first perusal, this chart on the screen. But basically, it, um, it speaks of the, uh, the prophets recorded in Scripture. And according to this chart, if you look at the far right, Ahijah, which is an amazing name in itself, it's R-I-Jah, or R-I-Yah, it's a Yah is the name of your God, Yah, Yahovah. Ah, ah, Yah. So very, very interesting um, that that's the first prophet on this chart. And he prophesied during the reign of 
uh, four kings, three of Judah, one of Israel, Rehoboam, Avayah, and Esar. Uh, they were the kings of Judah. Uh, and at the same time, Jeroboam was king of Israel. And that was uh, BC 931, which would be 2,953 years ago, uh, if we go with exactitude. Uh, and of course, it tells you how long those kings reigned. So, for example, Rehoboam reigned 17 years over Judah. Jeroboam uh, reigned 22 years over Israel. And of course, um, Avayah, which is another amazing name. It means father, Ayah, Av, Ava, B is pronounced as a, as a, as a gentle V in Hebrew, Ivri. Avayah, father, Ayah. Um, and he reigned for three years. And then Asa reigned for 41 years, one of the longest reigning kings of Israel ever. Uh, along with uh, Yoash further down there, number eight, he reigned for 40 years. Uzziah reigned for 52 years. Indeed, he's mentioned by several prophets. Man As, uh, number 14, reigned for 55 years. Man As. Man As. Eh? Man Asa. Manasseh reigned 55 years. So much more could be said about this. The point is, his friends, that um, one more thing I will say before we, we come to today's portion of scripture is two of the most prolific and best known prophets in scripture do not have books after their own name, Elijah and Elisha. Um, I believe that there are some books attributed to them upon the earth, but they're not in what we call the Bible. They're not in the collection of books known as the scriptures. Um, um, Elijah and Elisha uh, are a type of the father and the son speaking upon earth in time for well-being, righteousness, justice, holiness, goodliness, and truth. And Elijah is a type of the father and the name literally means God, I, Jehovah. El, I, Jah, God, I, Yahovah. El Aya. And then the name Elisha, Elisha, literally means God, I salvation. God, I salvation. So Elisha is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yahusha, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yahushua, Yeshua. It means God, I salvation. Whereas Elijah would be God in absolute form, the Father, God, I, Yah. God, I, Yah is Elijah, Elijah. God, I, salvation, El, I, Shah. You see? Uh, and they were very prolific. And of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the Lord Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the mountain, uh, Elijah and Moshe Moses appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, both those men were bodily taken. Um, Enoch, Elijah and Moses, uh, at the time of their departure from this earth, uh, were physically taken. They were physically taken. Now. So. Charts like this are useful, friends. Uh, and to keep things simple, if you take a look here um, to the, I mean, you've got to scroll down a little bit on the chart to come to, to Joel, number eight there. Um, Joel, if you look over on the right, um, and the chap admittedly in brackets puts guesswork. So in, in inferring the approximation of the chart, you see you, difficult to be to be exactly precise with, with specific years uh two and a half three thousand years later um but at any rate joel is the first one listed on this chart that that has a book of scripture attributed to him you see and then quickly followed by yonah today's book yonah um and they prophesied uh around 800 bc which was 2000 800 years ago, um, Joel and Jonah, uh, quickly followed by Amos and Isaiah. Now, the reason why we're doing it this way, friends, 
you may be aware, uh, regulars to the channel, that we recently completed an entire series on the Book of Amos, all nine chapters. We had a very powerful time going through those scriptures. Prior to that, there, we did 80 broadcasts on the entire book of Yeshayahu, Isaiah. 80 broadcasts uh, on the entire book of Isaiah. So if you look at this chart, friends, you'll see it goes Joel, Jonah, Amos, Isaiah. So the plan is to do Jonah today. Um, well, we won't get through the whole book today, but to start Jonah today um, and then to go on to Joel. And then we've already done Amos, Isaiah, uh, and then follow on down in a roughly chronological order through the rest uh, of the prophets. And we'll see how we get on because there's the two giants yet. Uh, there is uh, Ezekiel and there is Yahu, Jeremiah. Yeah. Um, and of course, they are weighty tomes, Ezekiel having around 50 chapters and Jeremiah 52 chapters. Um, so they're behemoths, they're giant books to, to get through. Uh, and of course, I've read them on a number of occasions, but to, to, to try and attempt thorough expositions of those books is months of a project so we'll see how we get on um but at any rate in the short term friends i just wanted to give a bit of a backdrop to the discourse concerning the prophets and, and as i said yesterday you know I, I i would say there there are three uh descriptive terms you could use for the uh, the different uh, uh size of the different books of the prophets you know they're there are uh, minor prophets, which, which, which refers to the quantity of scripture that the books of these particular prophets take up. For example, today's book, Yonah, would be a minor prophet. You know, it's, I believe it's four chapters. Haggai, which we did a couple of days ago, two chapters. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, major prophets, over 50, around 50, 60 chapters, 66 in Isaiah's case. But then you have medium prophets like Hosea, and Zechariah um, and Daniel that, that you know that have around 10 15 chapters um, and so there's medium major and minor prophets but, but those denotations only refer to the quantity of scripture attributed to each individual certainly infers in no way that any were greater than the other their effects or their ministry or the duration or uh, gravity of their ministry Okay, so without further ado, friends, let's come straight to today's text. We're in Jonah chapter one. And the Devar HaYahovah came unto Jonah, the son of Amitai. The word of Yahovah came unto Yonah, the son of Amatai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Yonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of Yahovah, and he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it and to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of Yahovah. But Yahovah sent unto them, sent out a great wind unto them upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest upon the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. And the mariners were afraid, and they cried every one to his God. And they cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to be lightened of them. But Yona had gone down into the lower part of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. And the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. Perhaps God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said each one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is come upon us. 
and they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Yona. And they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I revere Yahovah, the Elohayim of Hashemayim, the God of the heavens, who has made the sea and the dry land. Then vert the men exceedingly afraid, and they said unto him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of Yahovah, for he had told them. And they said to him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm to us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm to thee. For I know that because of me, this great tempest is upon thee. But the men rode hard to regain the land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. And they cried unto Yahovah and said, Yahovah, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, Yahovah, has done as it pleased thee. And they took up Yonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. And the men revered Yahovah exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto Yahovah and made vows. And Yahovah prepared a great fish to swallow up Yonah. And Yonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Yes, considering uh, the departure in obedient to Elohim uh, in not being faithful, in not continuing in grace, under the blood in the spirit, in holiness and righteousness and truth, uh, and failing to read the scripture sufficiently, this portion of the Bible is somewhat well known but principally, uh, rather specifically with regard to the fact that this man was swallowed by a giant sea creature um, and was alive in the belly of this big sea creature for days. Uh, unfortunately, little more than that is retained in the minds uh, of human beings. So let's attempt to rectify that, at least for the listeners um, but there's great power in the scriptures, friends, and, and make no mistake, whenever you read the scriptures aloud, it has effect upon the earth, for it is the word of God. So, wherever you see the word of the Lord came, it's Christ Jesus, the word of the Lord coming to Yonah, who was a chap in Israel, in the Middle East, and he was the son of Amittai. Uh, this chap gets a mention in the book of First Kings. And the word of Yahovah that came to him was very simple. Get up, go to Nineveh, which was a huge city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Very, very simple. Uh, one of the clearest uh, and simplest scriptures and revelations given to a man. Get up, go to that giant city and cry against it because of their wickedness. Yona, no, I'm going on holiday. And off he goes. Uh, he finds a ship, finds a ship, um, found a ship going to Tarshish, which I believe was the same place that the Apostle Paul was from, Saul of Tarsus. Um, 
and he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of Yahovah. So it's quite interesting. So it has to do uh, with men in rebellion going away from God, uh, and going into self-centeredness, egocentricity. It has to do with mankind uh, going away from righteousness, justice, holiness, and truth, and from the will of God. Um, and he paid the price thereof, it says in verse 3. Little did he know what would befall him. Um, now, what, what's very interesting about this story of Jonah is, is that he was... Uh, He knew that Yahovah was about to have mercy upon the persons of Nineveh. And because of the complexity of human motive, uh, Jonah did not want to deliver a message of mercy and grace and forgiveness to the city of Nineveh, which is quite strange. Um, I myself, having done a reasonable amount of street preaching in my time, um, of a period, and... Um, I can tell you, um, it just would have been the most wonderful thing had had persons listened to the word of God and repented. Um, I have seen it. I have I have had that happen as I've been preaching in the open air, uh, which is where preaching should really take place. You know, uh, I believe any Christian ought to be ready immediately to open the scriptures, or even without the scriptures being with them, and preach in any setting, if it be the will of God. But conversely, the command has already been given to mankind to go preach the gospel of peace, pardon, power, reconciliation, um, commanding men to obey the words of Jesus Christ and be immersed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, so that they may be faithful, obedient children of Elohim, Yahweh. Uh, but this chap fled to Tarshish. And of course, Joppa also has a mention in the book of Acts. So he paid the price, went down to it from the presence of Yahovah. So it's a very, very interesting chapter. Yahovah sent out a great wind upon the sea. There was a mighty tempest upon the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Now, in those days, uh, ships, we're perhaps prone to think of ships as they are in the modern era, uh, having engines, um, you know, having lots of provisions and comforts and being large, solid, constructed vessels like cruise liners or large fishing vessels. I myself live in a large fishing town here. Um, these huge vessels with uh, all kinds of things and lifeboats and uh, life jackets, things like this. Um, well, that was not the case uh, two and a half thousand years ago. If you got in a boat and went actually out to sea in it, uh, that was a serious business, you know. Uh, you know, particularly if you couldn't swim, and bear in mind that uh, we're talking about the Middle East, so there would be sharks uh, and other creatures, jellyfish in the sea, um, and whales and things like that. And so, you know, it was a very dangerous business being out at sea in those days. So a great wind blows upon the sea. And I think of Christ Jesus in the Gospels, when the great wind blew upon the sea and Christ was asleep, in the ship and the disciples came came and woke him up uh, and said to him master why are you sleeping why are you sleeping there's a great storm and it was said oh ye of little faith and the storm was rebuked and everything was calm um, but here in this account in Yona chapter one there was a mighty tempest upon the sea and it seemed like the ship was going to be broken now if the ship had been broken uh, most of the folk on it would have been would have died because if if the weather is that adverse to break a ship, then persons would not survive bobbing around on the ocean. Um, 
And yet a believer has a buoyancy that the world does not know. A believer in Christ Jesus uh, has a victory in scenes of contrariety. Uh, when circumstances come, uh, be of good cheer, Christ Jesus has overcome the world, the flesh and the devil. So it's quite a scene here. You have all these persons on a ship. Now, ships, uh, of course, are commercial vessels in the same way that aeroplanes and coaches and buses are uh, and trains. You know, they're not just going about for a pleasure cruise, you know. Um, persons uh, have to maintain the ship and make a profit. And so there would very likely be all kinds of fancy goods that, that would have been produced in the region of um, Joppa that would have been uh, being taken to Tarshish to sell. Um, and then there was very likely traders that had come from Tarshish to Joppa that had been trading in that region and, and were now returning home or onto the next port of call to do business in Tarshish or in that region. Um, there would have been crew members um, and there would have been persons visiting families and things like this, but they would have all been fairly wealthy persons, you know. Um, you know, e even the men that worked on the ship would have been, you know, the, these were not uh, persons that were poor persons on this ship. That's the point of the matter. Um, you know, we've come to take travel for granted now where most people are familiar with buses and trains at the very least. You know, there's over 20 million cars in Britain today, for example. Uh, and in the uh, 70s and 80s, the proliferation of aeroplane travel to principally to Spain, um, et cetera, and Portugal, we, we've seen travel uh, being much more of a luxury and a pleasure and an option as opposed to a necessity. But in those days, it was very much a necessity. So these would have been reasonably wealthy persons traveling by necessity on a ship, which would have been basically a large boat, a large wooden vessel with oars, perhaps some kind of sail, uh, and not a great deal more. You know, it would, it would have been a sizable vessel, but not a gigantic ship. Anyway, so here he is asleep in the ship, and the ship is about to be broken. Um, so they cry each one to his God, verse 5. Uh, and so that's mankind in trouble seeking help. Well, the devil can't help you. The devil can't help you, friends. He's deluded and destroyed and ruined. Help, power and deliverance come from Yehovah, not from men, not from devils. Your help comes from Yehovah who has created heaven and earth. You know, power belongs to Elohim. But there they are, every one of them crying to their God, terrified. I mean, this ship would have been going up and down and up and down. Things flying around, people being hurled from one ship side of the ship to the other. Um, and as I say, they would have been carrying all kinds of goods, perhaps livestock, perhaps linen, perhaps gold and silver coins perhaps things, uh, probably farming implements, uh, perhaps parts for building, all kinds of things would have been on this ship, for children, um, as I say, animals, all kinds of things, um, containers. And so it was that bad that they started throwing everything into the sea, uh, which means there's no hope in material goods, you know. Um, so they got rid of all those things, but it didn't make any difference. And Jonah had gone down into the lower part of the ship and was fast asleep. So Jonah, which means dove, was fast asleep. So this has to do uh, with the Holy Spirit and Christ and atonement and reconciliation. Uh, of course, we read that uh, after the flood, uh, that Noah sent forth a dove. Uh, and uh, when the dove returned with a twig between its beak, uh, that was the sign that the floods had abated and the dry land had appeared. And of course, the Holy Spirit appears in the form of a dove 
uh, at the time of the baptism of the Lord Jesus. So they're all calling unto their God. And they threw everything in the sea. There was no help in material possessions. Salvation is of God. And there's only one God. The Ancient of Days, the Father of Eternity, the King of the Universe, El Elohim Yahweh, thy Creator, thy Redeemer, thy Judge. Now, so it's very interesting. The shipmaster comes to him, says, what do you mean? Get up, call upon your God. Perhaps God will think upon us that we perish not. So call upon thy Elohim. Perhaps Elohim will think upon us that we perish not. That's the number six, which is the number of man. But it's very interesting that uh, these godless pagans and heathens that didn't know Elohim Yahweh personally um, would come to uh, Yona, which they'd probably by this time. So this wouldn't have been a gigantic ship. It wouldn't have been a, a small boat, but it wouldn't have been a huge ship. Um, and so they would have heard him come on and perhaps identified uh, that he was Jewish. Uh, and so they would have very likely known that Elohim Yahweh was the God of the Jews, because at that time, uh, the historicity of the uh, waters that destroyed the Egyptians pursuing the Jews when they were escaping the wicked slavery uh, of Pharaoh of Egypt, that would have been well known. The victories in battle would have been known. Um, you know, the greatness of Elohim Yahweh was already known upon the planet at that time. And so very likely uh, they, they knew of the creator. And so it's interesting that they say at first, call upon your God. And then it says, perhaps God will think upon us. So there's some recognition uh, of, uh, of deity. And then verse 7, they said each one to his fellow, come let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this vial has come upon us. And they cast lots and the lot fell upon Yona. So this is one of those few instances in scripture where they cast lots to find out the specificities of a matter. And the lot falls upon our friend Yona. And they say, come on, tell us, why is this evil thing happened? What's your occupation? Where have you come from? What's your country? And of what people are you? So they want to know who he is. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I revere Yahweh, the Elohayayim v'hashamayim, who has made the sea and the dry land. And it's quite a verse. I am a Hebrew. I fear Jehovah, the God of the heavens, who has made the sea and the dry land. <clears throat> So then they were exceedingly afraid. They would have heard the power of his words. They would have heard the power of his words, friends, the voice. They would have heard the Holy Spirit speaking through him. And they knew. And they said, what is this you have done? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of Jehovah, for he had told them. So picture the scene, the boat's going up. Up and down, the waves are crashing on the deck. They've already thrown all their possessions overboard to lighten the ship. Parts of the ship were already perhaps broken. Perhaps some of the oars uh, or the sides of the ship. Persons would have been thrown around here and there. Maybe it was dark, it doesn't say. Uh, but this would have been a terrifying situation. And here's this chap, Jonah, saying, well, yeah, it'll be my fault. Yeah, yeah, I'm fleeing from Jehovah, the creator of everything. Oh, no, what we're going to do? What we're going to do? <laughs> what shall we do? Um, and so they say that to him. What shall we do? That the sea may be calm to us, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And that is uh, Yona 111. Um, and... Really, 
you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is the purpose of all scripture. The revelation of every book of scripture is the son of God, the Lord Jesus. Um, and so it's a great question. Um, what shall we do to thee that the sea may be calm for us? And the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Very, very interesting, friends. Yonah 111. Um, so you could say it's a question of deity concerning mankind and the need for calm and well-being for all mankind. Um, you could say it's a deity in man saying to God, what can we do that everything will be calm? And then in the middle, you have the Christ God, the Son of God, who took all the punishment of God uh, vicariously uh, on behalf of all mankind in order to become the Lord and Savior of all mankind. And at the present time, um, is a question for all mankind. What shall all mankind do concerning the owner, the judge, the king, the head, the maker, and the preserver of all mankind and all the earth? What shall mankind do today to Christ Jesus? What shall mankind do vis-a-vis -vis obedience, worship, reverence, thanksgiving, blessing and honour and esteem and glory in order that there might be peace upon this earth? Because the situation grew more and more tempestuous. You see, there's no counsel against Elohim Yahweh. The council of Elohim Yahweh is over all flesh and all nations right now. This earth doth not belong to men, nor does this earth belong to devils. This earth belongs to the Lord God Omnipotent. Here God Almachtig, the Lord God. So it's a great question that they asked. There they were in trouble. Absolutely powerless. Mortals, absolutely powerless. Like unto the repentant thief upon the cross. All he could do was behold deity and come into accord and supplicate deity. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that is the state of every man. Completely powerless. The only thing men can do is come into agreement with deity and be agreeable with the king of the universe the Christ God, the Ancient of Days incarnate. That was the only option available. There they were on the ship. They'd already thrown all their possessions over, which would have been horrendous for these folks, for these would have been wealthy folks on the ship. You know, to travel on a ship was expensive. Uh, and not only that, you would only be traveling somewhere if you had funds to, 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 for you to subsist where you were going and uh, also purpose and also the capacity to maintain what you left behind. Or indeed, it would be for the purpose of commerce, you see. So these persons would have been wealthy folks on this ship and even the persons that worked on the ship uh, to some degree as well. And they threw over all their possessions. So there they were completely helpless. Uh, and what's very interesting about Jonah chapter one is um, the, these two points here. Uh, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm to us and the sea grew more and more tempestuous? And he says to them, take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm to thee. For I know that because of me, this great tempest is upon thee. So this is a very, very interesting metaphor of the Lord Jesus Christ on several levels. Um, and indeed, just on this one topic in, in this specificity of this chapter, one could probably talk for hours. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, what you're reading about here is God's purposes in Christ concerning mankind. Uh, and the need for all mankind to be in agreement with Elohim, Yahweh, to be subject persons 
um, and to be judicially clear and to be reconciled and come into a place of obedience and reverence for Yahweh. Um, you're also reading about uh, the sufferings of Christ 2,000 years ago. You're reading about the willingness of Christ to be a sacrifice for you all. You're reading about um, the need for wicked men and devils to conspire together to physically crucify Christ 2,000 years ago. And you're reading about, as I say, um, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despise the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You're reading about divine purposes in redemption and deliverance for mortals, practical deliverance. Let's not forget, Christianity is very practical. This earth is full of rotten corpses. Everyone that's ever walked this planet will live again, right? Because Christ arose from the tomb, right? The firstborn from among the dead, which means however difficult it is to hear these things, that everyone else is still under the sentence of death. Only Christ Jesus has been born from among the dead. First woman's womb became a tomb, and everyone born from it has died apart from this living generation. And Christ's tomb became the womb of the morning, and the dew of the morning came out of the womb, the firstborn from among the dead. Christ, the King of Israel, the root and the offspring of Jesse, the creator of Jesse, which was David, King David's father, and the offspring of Jesse, incarnate deity. So, as I say, friends, uh, one of the greatest verses in this chapter is Yonah 111. The inquiry is of men, what shall we do unto thee, to Christ Jesus in time, that life may be calm to us and that there won't be any more trouble? Yonah's answer is, pick me up, throw me in the sea, and the sea will be calm to thee. Now, this wasn't a few waves, friends, and one or two persons throwing up over the side. No, this was a horrendous situation. Uh, the ship was being smashed. They, were, they knew they faced imminent death. They knew that their possessions couldn't help them. And they knew that their only help was in Christ. But what's unique is that this is Yona who was fleeing from the will of God. So come, come, let us proceed through, through the... Uh, the account. Now, they rode hard to regain the land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. It's very interesting. It's like they didn't want to throw him overboard. So they would have heard the voice of his words and the power and the holiness of the words of Yona. You see, when he spoke to them, so he told them everything that he was fleeing from Yahweh, that he was a Hebrew. And his God was the God of heaven, the God of earth, the creator of the skies, the creator of the earth. Um, and so they tried their best, but they could not. I, I would imagine this speaks of men under the first covenant that couldn't keep the law and couldn't obtain righteousness out with the finished work of Christ. Uh, men attempting to be righteous by keeping the law. And we see it in the present day, many men and women. They don't look to Christ upon the cross. They don't eat his flesh and drink his blood. They're not in obedience to the blood or to the gospel of Christ. They are rather thinking that by keeping the law, that they have righteousness with God. Though the scripture saith clearly, by works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Even the Christ kept the law perfectly. Christ hath done all things well. Now, the law is holy, noble, just and good, but unable for mortals um, to be just through it because they couldn't keep it. 
no matter how much they tried, you see. And so they cried out to Yahweh and said, Yahweh, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, Yahweh, hast done as it's pleased thee. So it's very, very interesting. Um, it's also a story of conversion. These wealthy persons there in a place of vulnerability where their possessions and their money couldn't afford them safety. And they were at God's mercy. Um, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, and God, for the sake of Nineveh, um, was doing all this for the sake of the, the human beings, the greater good of the inhabitants of, of Nineveh. Um, in order that mercy and grace might be shown to men and women and children in that great city. It would have been a huge city. But what's interesting here is that they call upon the personal name of Yahovah. Now, the only mention of that name being mentioned on that ship was in verse 9, where, where Yonah says, I am an Ivri, I revere Yahweh, the Elohim, Vahashamayim, who has made the sea and the dry land. You see? Um, Earlier on in the chapter, they'd asked Jonah to call upon his Elohim, his God. Perhaps Elohim will think upon us. But now in verse 14, they are crying out to Yahweh because Jonah had said, you must throw me in the ocean and then the sea will be calm for you and you'll all be saved. You'll all be saved. So it's absolutely to do with Christ being willing to be crucified. Think of Christ Jesus being beaten his face all beaten in, his beard all ripped out, his back has 30 pounds of bloody mincemeat um, and being nailed to a cross by life, by his own life. That's the mystery of it, friends. Christ is the life in every human being. Think of Christ being willing to be crucified by men he had created, by men in whom the life was him, was he. And it's something of a complex metaphor, is, is, is Yona, when you look properly at it. Um, because the men didn't want to kill Jona, or they thought they would kill him. See, they didn't have hope in the resurrection. They thought if they throw him over the, the side, that would be it. Um, and it has to do with the will of men um, doing the will of devils. Um, sometimes somewhat reluctantly doing wickedly um, it has to do with atonement willingness uh, and these persons did not have faith in the resurrection or faith in Jonah surviving their faith in God was not correct you see So it was also a conversion experience for these persons. Many of them became believers in the Creator. And they became believers in Elohim Yahweh as a result of these events. Indeed, they called upon Yahweh. And the scripture says in Joel 32 and in Acts and in Romans, uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, God is gracious. Uh, faithful, loving, merciful, and kind to all who call upon him, even those that call upon him in truth. So, family, it's a very, very complex metaphor um, and historical event, but to look closely at it in the light of the rest of the revelation of Scripture, to understand the Son of God uh, and his willingness I mean, he prayed, as it were, and sweat dr great drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane. 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 Gethsemane, the sea of souls. The many children of Elohim, Yahweh, that would have been lost. You are all God's offspring. You are all the offspring of Yahweh. You must serve, honor, and obey, Yahweh. All flesh will be righteous. 
This earth will be filled with glory. The foul air, the doomed, deluded, destroyed demon will be chained along with his minions. And they will be cast into the pitch darkness of the bottomless abyss for a thousand earth years. And then they shall be released for a short time. And then they shall all be thrust into the fiery lake of eternal contempt. And the smoke of their torment shall descend before me night and day forever. All those that love and make a lie that reject the Lord Jesus Christ will be likewise doomed and damned. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All flesh shall see the Son of God as crucified and shall mourn. They shall mourn. They shall weep. You are all creature possessions. You are all precious, beloved. The king's daughter, all glorious within. The queen in gold of Ophir upon my right hand are seven stars. Now, what's very interesting about uh, verse 14 uh, is the correlation between this, where the persons on the ship cry out, Yahweh, don't let us die for this man's life. So they're now concerned about the man that they had to throw overboard. <clears throat> don't lay innocent blood upon us, for thou, Yahweh, has done <clears throat> as it pleased thee. So this is a declaration of faith and trust in Yahovah, the creator, the sovereign, the king of the whole universe. This is a declaration of faith in this situation of trouble. Um, it's much better if men seek Yahweh, give worship, reverence and obedience voluntarily. Um, it's awful to consider that that thief on the cross had to go through all he went through in order to end up uh, bleeding out, beaten suffocatively upon a Roman torture stake, being spat upon and mocked in order to come to Christ Jesus. Um, many persons go through terrible situations in order to come to faith in Christ. There are many ways to Christ, but Christ is the only way to God. Um, also, the mystery is that Elohim Yahweh brings persons to his son uniquely. But as regards natural practicalities, what men go through, um, I mean, when persons are presented the gospel of Jesus Christ, of mercy, peace, pardon, and power, uh, it is recorded that they had the opportunity to repent towards God and have faith in Christ Jesus. Um, there is a book written where these things are recorded and the books will be open. Uh, and the problem is particularly adult humans that have spoken against the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the ones that are in big, big, big trouble, friends. It's one thing to not know, but to speak against Elohim Yahweh, to speak against Adonai Yeshua, to speak against the Ruach HaKodesh, uh, to speak against the Ruach HaYahushua HaMashiach, are very, very, very solemn things. There is no forgiveness for blasphemy against the Spirit of God. Be very, very cautious, friends. Elohim Yahweh sees and understands all things. Now, What's interesting is at the time of the crucifixion of Christ, the Jews cried out to Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children's heads. Which is a very solemn thing to say. But here, these persons, uh, which would have been persons from various nations as well. That's another point. They wouldn't have been all Jewish persons. Um. Indeed, I would, I would go as far as to, 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 to say that the majority of persons would not have been Jewish persons on this particular ship going to Tarshish from Joppa. But they cry out for Elohim Yahweh to have mercy upon them and not lay the innocent blood of Yona upon them. And they acknowledge the sovereignty of Yahweh. 
So they take up Yonar, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. The men revered Yahweh exceedingly, and when it says men, it refers to mankind. Friends, so if there's any of my listeners uh, of the fairer sex, females, uh, the true heroes on the planet that uh, raise young and uh, keep homes, um, never be offended. Uh, it, it, does, it does appear patriarchal, the uh, scripture, um, but it simply means mankind. That's what it simply means. Uh, the men, mankind, so there would have been men and women on the ship, they revered Yahweh exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. So they had natural revelation of the power of the unseen God. They had experience of an actual miracle. Uh, and unlike the account in the Gospels of what happened on the Sea of Galilee, which similar things happened various times, but that particular account in the Sea of Galilee, when uh, peace be still and the raging ocean uh, and the weather ceased and there was great calm at the voice of Jesus. Well, here also there was great calm. And what's interesting is it says they offered a sacrifice to Yahuwah. Well, the sacrifice was that they threw Yona over the side, which is a type of Christ, you see. So it's a very interesting metaphor, uh, very interesting And they made vows. They they promised to serve Yahweh. The tremendous conversion experience. And you think as well that when these persons got to their destination, uh, to Tarshish, they would have gone their separate ways, somewhat poorer materially, but exceedingly richer uh, than the majority of the persons they was to encounter, for they had received grace and mercy and sovereign provision. And they had salvation, for they called upon Yahweh, and Yahweh heard them. And before they called, he answered, Yahweh knowing things from eternity to eternity. Um, I will be found of those that inquire of me. Before you call, I will answer. Uh, the secret of Yahweh is with those that revere him. Uh, and so what's amazing is that these persons became sensible of compassion and mercy. When Jonas said, it's my fault, I'm running from the Lord, uh, I've got a calling on my life to go and preach so that persons can have help and mercy and grace and I'm running from it. Uh, if you throw me in the ocean, everything will be right. They didn't just say, right, old lads, grab him, throw him over, that's that. Okay, now carry on, right, we're head plotting a correct course, off we go. No, no, that's not what happened. They were concerned and sensible about this man's life. They were concerned about his well-being. And the greater picture is they were concerned about Yahweh Elohim being punitive towards them for their treatment of this man. Um, and so they asked for mercy. And they even tried to get back to land in verse 13, but they could not because the troubles, the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. And Yahovah prepared a great fish to swallow up Yona, and Yona was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And what's interesting, of course, uh, is, is that they have since proved that a, a gigantic sea creature, you could quite possibly survive in the, in the insides of them because they have air in there, which is, uh, you know, that's a scientific fact that they've discovered between then and now. Um, and of course, this is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ being in the tomb, being in death uh, vicariously. Um, much more could be said about this chapter, friends. I'm just conscious of time uh, and brevity. But what's interesting, and of course, the, the prime difference between Jonah and the Lord Jesus Christ was that uh, Christ was willing to go to the cross uh, and willing to pay the price and willing to do the will of God, um, and willing to suffer awfully at the hands of sinners. But Yona did not want to uh, make a physical journey and go and preach uh, at Nineveh. 
I suppose it has to be said that he was, you know, it's, diff it's difficult to sort of uh, guess the motives of uh, of Yona because, I mean, you know, Nineveh would have been a, a quite a wicked place, a place of violence, drunkenness, sexual perversion, oppression and fear and and wickedness. You know, there's no question about it. Um, and so perhaps he was fearful of being beaten or abused or tortured or killed at the hands of the Ninevites. Uh, perhaps he was conscious that he might be thrown into prison. Prisons in those days were horrendous places uh, in hot countries with poor food and sanitation or no sanitation. That would be more like it. Stinking places. Um, you know, so, you know, the motives for Yona not wanting to go there would have been probably various. Um, but what's interesting is, is he's like, no, I'm going on holiday. I'm heading over to uh, to Tarshish with these good folks on a ship. Got my ticket. And it says at the beginning of the passage, he paid the fare thereof. And he certainly did pay the fare thereof. Um, and of course, the, the cost of his choice was... Uh, was being thrown overboard and then being swallowed by a whale. Elohim Yahweh sent the whale. So it's a story of God's sovereignty, uh, man's inadequacy and unwillingness, um, but mercy and grace and provision. And of course, for Yona, as we shall see in the next chapter, he is spewed upon the beach and then he moves forward to declare the message of love, life, grace uh, and power to the Ninevites. So he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Um, yes, yes. So, so Yona was a man of, of great faith, but not a man of great willingness. That's the thing. And that, that's the, I mean, it, it says in the New Testament scriptures, um, you know, the the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, the, the apostle Paul, who God used to write half of the New Testament scriptures, he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Um, he also said, uh, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Uh, he also said in Romans, Lewis Romans 5 and 6 um, and 7, they're the uh, poignant chapters on this topic. The good that I want to do, I don't do, and the evil I don't want to do, I do do, or oh, wretched man that I am. Um, and so, you know, um, the, the reality is the faithfulness and mercy of God and the faith, you know, the faith was there with Yona, but not the willingness. You know, he, he, he was not keen. You know, he knew the power of Yahuwah. Uh, he had the word of Yahuwah coming unto him. Uh, and he simply had to go to a town and, and preach and declare the word of God. But he didn't want to. And then when he gets on this ship, uh, He's fast asleep in the ship. They come and wake him up. He says, oh, I'm a Hebrew. I revere Yahweh, the creator of the skies, the God of the heavens, who has made everything. Um, and that he also told them he was fleeing from the presence of Yahweh. And they said in uh, Yonah 111, what shall we do that the sea may be calm? The sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he had the answer. Pick me up, throw me into the sea, and everything will be all right. The sea will be calm to you because I know that because of me, this great trouble is come upon you. All flesh will bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every nation, every human, every angel, and every devil. Everybody will bow the knee to Christ. You're not new. The value of human life. He was willing to die in order that they might live. He was willing to give his life 
that everyone on that ship might live. But he was not willing to go to Nineveh that the Ninevites might live. But in that situation, when presented with men and women, and probably children and animals, were about to die in front of him, he was willing to die himself in order that they might live. Circumstances, as it were, conspired together in order to produce <clears throat> the desired willingness and of course a sacrifice in type and of course you know perhaps some of those persons on that ship had faith in the god of the heavens who controlled the weather and the ocean um, and circumstances that jonah would survive somehow but probably most of them thought he would die so they thought they'd thrown a man to their death in order for them to live. So very much the principle of sacrifice was there. Um, and Yona was prepared to, uh, to die in order that they might live, not necessarily knowing that he would live. And yet you have the tender benevolences and loving kindnesses and covenantal providential of, of Elohai Yehovah um, over and through everything. It's quite a powerful chapter, friends, and one could say much more about it uh, and probably will on the next broadcast. Um, the thing is, friends, is to be in the scriptures, to be exercised about the word of God, to, to if you want to be delivered from darkness, from death and from the devil, be agreeable to the word of God. Stay in the scriptures, read them aloud. You know, if you're, if you're a regular listener to, to this channel, then also have your own personal scripture studies. Please feel free to get involved if you want to reach out to me in the conversation. If you want to add anything, please do. You know, if you want to discuss anything that's mentioned, please do. It would be nigh on impossible in around an hour, an hour and a half to, uh, to give full revelation uh, of a portion of scripture. But the idea is vicarious atonement, uh, willingness, um, faithfulness, the sovereignty of God, the knowledge of men around the sovereignty of God uh, and divine purposes, really. Uh, deliverance, well-being, everyone was safe on that ship. The only thing that was lost was their material possessions. Um, and we will go on to read that Yona does indeed go to Nineveh and does indeed preach to them. Um, and they hear his voice they repent of their sins and they receive salvation. And Yonah 117 says, Yahweh prepared a great fish to swallow up Yonah. And Yonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The type of Christ Jesus in the tomb. And I will mention this, friends, one of the unusual features of scripture that's somewhat of a baffling thing to many believers uh, is that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ rose on the third day. So he was crucified on what we call a Friday. He was dead uh, for the latter part of Friday, the entirety of Saturday, and he rose on the third day on the Sunday. But that's two nights, Friday and Saturday night, and rising on the third day. But here and elsewhere in scripture, we read of three days and three nights. Well, it's very, very simple, friends. Very, very simple. Very, very simple to answer that. He rose on the third day, but there was only two nights. But it was the night of the curse. The, if you, 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 to get understanding of scripture, friends, you've sometimes got to go back to the types, particularly in the Old Testament scriptures, to understand these things. The lamb, the Passover lamb, the Paschal lamb was to be sacrificed and was sacrificed between the two evenings. The evening of the Old Testament period and the evening of the New Testament period. Why, why is present time referred to as an evening? Well, because gross darkness covers mankind, that's why. 
the only light is in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the life in every one of you and the one that's keeping you all alive right now. The only life and deliverance for mankind is in the Lord Jesus Christ. But gross darkness covers mankind. Make no mistake about it. So why does it say three days and three nights? Well, it was still the night of the curse when cries of Christ arose out of the tomb. Mankind was still under the curse. Christ is waiting for his wife, his bride right now. Oh, yes. You see? And of course, on the third day will be the dawning of that bright and glorious morning. And we are now a second to that dawning. Um, we are awaiting the next great event on the planet, which is a global resurrection of hundreds of millions of human beings to be clothed with immortality and life. And to have joy and gladness eternal. Now. So the third night refers to the reality that when Christ, the firstborn from amongst the dead, came out of the tomb, mankind was still under the curse, you see. So it, it refers to the reality of things upon the earth, gross darkness covering the peoples. I mean, the beauteous thing is when mortals repent and put their faith in Christ Jesus and uh, trust in God, and are faithful and obedient children of Elohim, they receive grace, light, mercy, and peace to sustain them in the face of contrariety and to experience practical deliverance from the world, the flesh, and the devil. For believers have a buoyancy the world does not understand. Uh, but in order for them to have that buoyancy, Christ had to suffer, bleed, die, and be laid in the tomb three days and to rise from among the dead. Um, the rock of ages out of the freshly hewn rocky tomb, the rock rolled away from the door, and uh, now life eternal uh, and uh, eternal redemption is to all those that call upon him in truth. So Christ was in the tomb, you see, these three days. Well, thanks so much for tuning in, family. It's been wonderful sharing with you. Uh, trust that you all well, the face of Eloah, Yahweh, give you peace and joy you and your families in every way. Rejoice in the truth, stay in the scriptures, and we'll be back soon with another broadcast. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>